before listening to the sermon, if you could please read Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 9 to 20. That's the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament, quite a small book near the end of the Old Testament. Zephaniah uh, chapter 3 is the closest thing in the Bible to a love song. In verse 14, we have God's people, Israel, instructed to sing, shout and rejoice over the goodness of God's love towards them. Then in verse 17, we have God delighting and rejoicing over the people that he loves. But is the love described in these verses any more meaningful than that of a typical love song? After all, most love songs are typically about emotional crushes that last no longer than the song's length, three and a half minutes. Few love songs are sang about a 50-year marriage in which a couple have persevered in loving each other through and through. I sincerely hope God's love is more like the second than the first. But it would do us a great but it would do us good to come face to face with the opinions of those who would disagree. Eric Carmen, for example, is a cartoon character in the adult comedy South Park. And he begins his career in the cartoon as a fake Christian songwriter. He begins his career with these words. All we have to do to make Christian songs is take regular old songs and add Jesus stuff to them. See, all we have to do is cross out words like baby and darling and replace them with Jesus. Eric Carmen's basic point is this. The love of Christianity is no more meaningful than that between a teenage boy and girl. It's all excessive sentimental, excessively sentimental. It's all driven by emotion without reason, feelings without substance. It's all sloppy, slushy, sugar-coated mush. The good news is chapter 3 shows that the love of Christianity is of the completely opposite kind. In fact, it is the most meaningful type of love that exists. Zephaniah chapter 3 shows us that God's love is a love of facts and a love that reacts. A love of facts and a love that reacts. So firstly, a love of facts. If on February the 14th, I received a card through my door saying, I love you, I'd be the first to be a little sceptical. The card has either arrived at the wrong address or as a prank from my sister, or as an act of sympathy from my mum. However, if I received a card saying, I forgive you, I'd not be as sceptical. For if everybody in the world had my address, I could think of more than one person who could be sending me that card. And if the card went on to say, I forgive you, but I love you, I'd believe these words more than I would believe the words, I love you, by themselves. Why? Because the first person didn't really know me, whereas the second person really did. If someone says, I love you, without knowing the facts about you, that person's love is either meaningless and false, or purely based on passing emotion. But in chapter 3, before God speaks of loving Israel, God acknowledges the truth. In verses 1 to 5, God speaks of Israel's people being rebellious, defiled, disobedient, faithless, rebellious, cruel to others, unprincipled, treacherous, profane. Before God even speaks of loving Israel, God acknowledges the facts. Israel was not the most livable thing since sliced bread. And yet, God showed them love despite knowing the worst about them. Verse 17. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves you. 
He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you or rejoice over you with singing. God's song of love over his people is neither emotionally driven or cliched and sentimental. For it is a song sung in the face of the facts of Israel's sinfulness. A song sung in the face of the truth. And the good news the rest of the Bible testifies to is this. God's love towards you is the same. God's love knows the facts about you. And yet, like with Israel, God did something to save you. Romans 5 verse 8 But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know, God could use the facts about the true you to rebuke you and to rebuke me. But out of love, he chose to forgive. As it says in Isaiah, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. God's love is not emotionally driven like that of a love-struck teenager. It's based on who he is, not how he feels. And this is very, very good news indeed. But picture the typical pop artist who sings about love. Their debut song is titled, I Really Love You. Their follow-up song is called, I Really Really Love You. Their next hit is called, I Really 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 Love You. And their next song is titled, You Ate the Last Malteser, You're Dumped. A teenager who says, I love you on their first date, often texts, you're dumped the next morning. For such a love is based on emotions, not facts. And the words, I love you, mean no more than, I love you currently, with those looks, with that dress, and at this age. But as soon as I see a wrinkle, I'm off. But God's love, God's love is of a different kind. It's not forever changing like that of a teenager. That's why this love song of chapter 3 speaks of a relationship that lasts. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 14. Sing, daughter Zion. Shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. These verses speak of God's commitment to his people. Speaking of Jerusalem as a daughter, somebody who in whom God has a permanent relationship. Somebody who will never remember their sins anymore, but will be with them so that they never again need to fear any harm. And since God's love towards his New and Old Testament people is the same, the same principle applies. God's love is a love of commitment. If you are a believer, you can be sure of God's permanent acceptance. Your every sin has been dealt with. You can be sure of God's permanent good favour. You do not need to twist his arm before he'll show you favour. If you're a believer, you can be sure of God's permanent presence. Every new day you wake up, he'll be there. Zephaniah. Uh, so, that's firstly, a love of fact, and secondly... I love that reacts. The fact of Israel's sinfulness didn't exclude them from God's love. But though God was offering them love without exclusion, he was not offering them love 
without distinction. Instead, verses 11 and 12 speak of the distinction God makes between the humble and the proud. Verses 11 and 12. I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the hum meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. Those described as the arrogant and haughty could not be in a relationship with God, nor would God be saving them from exile. And chapter 1 explains why. Chapter 1 verse 12 reads like this. God speaks, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. The people described didn't want a God who reacted to their sin. They wanted a God who was indifferent, a God who was apathetic, disinterested and unconcerned by their sin, to the point that he didn't care. They were like the man who prefers his relationship with his computer to his relationship with his wife. But the great thing about computers is that they know we make mistakes but they allow us to make them. For example, the computer asks, would you like to delete all the photos of your wedding? If you click yes, the computer will allow it. It will not warn you of the consequences or ask you to reconsider. The computer asks, are you sure you'd like to spend money you don't have on something you don't need? If you click buy now, your computer will only ever respond with the words, permission granted. The computer asks, would you like to shut me down? If we respond by saying, no actually, I'd much rather my wife shut up and you stayed on so I can watch another six hours of YouTube. If you do that, what will the computer do? It will do whatever you want. It will let you waste your time and destroy your relationship with your wife. A computer won't react to our mistakes or ask us to change. Where, as those who, with whom we have meaningful, meaningful relationships do. Friends who tell us the truth even though we might not like it. Family who lovingly point out our mistakes. People who love us as, as we are but who are committed to helping us become more. All of these people react to our errors and love us enough to ask us to change. You can tell you have a meaningful relationship with your family, friends or spouse when they react to your sin or stupidity. You can tell you have a meaningful relationship with God when he does the same. Chapter 3, verse 9, God says, I will purify the lips of the people, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. The people of Israel were like that husband who spent more time on YouTube than he did with his wife. For Israel was worshipping idols and calling on them for help. In doing so, Israel was destroying themselves and destroying their relationship with God. But God would not sit back apathetic. He would react. Verse 9, I will purify the lips of the peoples. Verse 12, the remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. In one sense, God loved Israel as they were, but he cared too much about them to leave them that way. They were destroying their relationship with God, and God would not allow it. Sin had snuck into their lives, and God would not rest until every cell of the cancer of sin was removed. If a person who claims to love you does not react to your sin or stupidity, that person's love is meaningless. Whereas a person who truly loves you reacts. 
Do you have that type of relationship with God? Does his word call you up short? Do you feel guilt when you sin? Can you see God at work in your life, exposing wrong thoughts, attitudes and actions? Do you feel that God cares about every aspect of your life, including the bits nobody else sees? Is your relationship with God meaningful? Or would you rather God would be more like that computer that merely grants you permission to live as you please? The first of these is what a true relationship with God looks like. God loving you as you are, but unwilling to leave you that way. The second of these is idolatry. What I mean is this. The second command is so often overlooked by Christians, myself included. The second of God's Ten Commandments going like this. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. We think that because we don't bow down to blocks of woods, Block blocks of wood, we don't have need of this command. Thinking that the command God mentioned second does not need to be stressed that much. And yet, what is this command prohibiting? Worshipping a God that we've crafted ourselves, not only with our hands, but with our imaginations. When you or I say, I've always imagined God is like this, we are worshipping an idol, a God of our own imagination, as opposed to the God as revealed to us by the Bible. Most often this imaginary God is one who cares very little about our sin. So when you and I, so for example, I say to myself, I'm sure God would understand why I'm doing this, even though the rest of the Bible contradicts it. When I do that, I'm worshipping an idol. I say, I like these bits of the Bible, but I prefer to overlook these bits, picking and choosing which of God's commands do and don't apply, creating a false image of God based on my personal preferences. Most often this image of God is a God who is indifferent to my sin. I say, I believe God would want this for me, even though I am the one who wants it, and I'm just imagining that God does too. Have you ever found yourself subconsciously saying, yes, this command may be in the Bible, but I'd much rather not obey it. Yes, I know Jesus spoke of such commitment, but that's not how I like my religion to work. I'd much rather God didn't interfere in my life that much. A God who fits in with your personal preferences and always agrees with you is an idol. And such a relationship is no more meaningful than that with a computer. Always saying yes because it knows that's what you want to hear. In chapter 3, God is offering you and I something more meaningful and something more wonderful. A relationship with a loving God who reacts, saving us from our sin, saving us from ourselves, and saving us for himself. Verse 14, sing daughter Zion, shout aloud Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment, he has turned back your enemy, the Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Daughter Zion, God's people are seen singing, shouting and rejoicing. Why? Because not only God, not only has God saved them from something, he has saved them to something as well. The Lord has taken away your punishment. They've been saved from something. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. They've been saved to something. They've been saved to a relationship with a wonderful king. 
hang on a second, saved to be God's servants. That doesn't sound very appealing. We'd much rather be kings, not servants. We want God to be our servant, giving us permission to do whatever we want, giving us the power to fulfil our dreams, giving us permission to stay as we are and not change. But what kind of mess would our life be in if God, our parents, or anybody else allowed us to do exactly that? Always having our own way, that would be a recipe for disaster. That's why I'd rather be a servant to God than a king over him. For I am saved, and you are saved, if you're a believer, to a wonderful king. A king who loves you as you are, but who loves you enough to not leave you that way. A king who not only wants what is best for you, but knows what is best for you as well. A king who can see how we are destroying ourselves before we can see it, warning us in advance. A king who paid the price so that we can have a relationship with him and who urges us to pr preserve this relationship as well. This is what a meaningful relationship with God looks like. You won't find a better relationship elsewhere. So God's love is a love of facts. Know that God's love is based on the truth about you. And for that reason, he will never go back on his commitment towards you. God's love is a love that reacts. Know that God cares about you enough not to leave you as you are. For this reason, allow him to speak and change you through his spirit and through his word.